Hi class, in today's lesson we're going to move on to a slightly new part of the topic which is going to be on desktop publishing terms and techniques. Now the aim is that in this series of lessons you're going to learn to identify and apply the range of terms and techniques which are part of the National 5 Graphic Communication course. And these are terms, that is to say terminology, that are used within desktop publishing software and techniques that are used while using desktop publishing software to create layouts. So this has a strong link to elements and principles and would also be beneficial when answering questions in an exam where you're asked to analyze a layout and discuss how terms or certainly how um, things have been applied because the, the terminology used is going to be quite important to that, being able to understand what we're supposed to call things and, um, and think about how we could use these different techniques when we're, we're creating our own layouts. So anyway, um, in this first lesson, we're going to cover a series of things from paper sizing, uh, page formats, margins, grids, guidelines, bleed, handles, rotate, color fills, transparency, cropping, drop shadows, and the copy, cut, and paste process. Now, the range of techniques and terms here, some of them will not be new to you. They'll be things that you've done before. Um, sometimes it'll really just be a case of putting a name to something you've done before but didn't know what it was called. Some of the terms in here you'll maybe not have used before or maybe not really know how they apply to desktop publishing. So th the hope is that through this you'll understand how to apply these different techniques and also understand why they're important in terms of you know how this applies to the process of printing or producing graphics. So to do it, you're going to use uh, Gravity as we did last time. And you're going to create your own new document and basically follow through a couple of little tasks that will allow us to apply these different terms and techniques, or at least consider how they're applied when we're creating a document. Now, obviously, we would normally use Zara while we were in school, but because we're not in school, we're, we're going to start with having used Gravity. So I'm going to try and take you through it step by step. You may find that I may stumble here and there because I'm not so used to using Gravity either. Um, but hopefully it should be pretty straightforward to follow. And... I think it's good to understand that learning these techniques in one piece of software doesn't mean it's a waste of time if you're using a different piece of software because the skills are fundamentally the same. The only difference is usually just that the options might be in a slightly different place. The fact is you can essentially do all the same things regardless of what desktop publishing software you're using. So anyway, first thing we're going to look at is paper sizing. So if you open or go to Gravity and click Start Now. You should have been able to sign in with your Google account, but make sure you don't choose the, the full version, the free trial as it were. So we're just going to hit X here, stick with this free version. And the first thing we'd said we'd talk about was paper sizing. So in uh, Gravity, the way that we go about that is choosing the print option, and that gives us a range of standard paper sizes that we can choose. Now, standard paper sizes are quite important to consider designing around because when printing, most of the printing industry is built around printing things on standardized sizes of um, paper. And so if we start trying to make things on unusual sizes, it can make the cost more expensive. It's not to say that you can't, it's just that that's usually a good starting point. So for us, we're going to imagine that we're working on A3. Imagine your client had said to you, you want a, or they wanted an A3 poster. You just need to make sure that you size your paper appropriately. So we're going to start our document, and the first thing I want to point out is that this idea of this term single page format. Single page format simply means it's a type of document that's on a single page. So that would be, for example, maybe a business card, a poster, a single page leaflet. These are all single page layouts. Multi-page layouts would be things like magazines, brochures, and so on. So if we look at this example here, sorry, wrong one. Uh, yeah, if we look at this example here, we can see this is an example of a multi-page layout because each separate page has its own layout. Now, although they're all joined together, it's still technically a multi-page layout, but a book, magazine, that would also be an example of it. In Gravity, you can do that. You can over here at the side create a new page. And if you turn on the multi-page mode, um, what you can do is you can actually see that you've got the different pages beside each other and you can position them as you want. So if you were trying to design a double page spread, for example, for a magazine, you can create multiple pages and place them beside each other. But we're just going to stick with a single page. So for you, just stick with one page like that. Now, um, there are a couple of other things that we're going to look at next. The first is that when we design a layout, quite often we add a margin for the contents. 
And the margin is just the space around the boundary of the page where things are not going to go. So if we looked at, for example, this, exam, uh, this design here, we can see there's a kind of a gap down the side and across the top, um, which is not filled with anything. There's usually a space around that. Um, and if we look at any other kinds of um, printed goods, like I'm just trying to think if I've got any examples. I don't think I have any examples to hand, but we'll, we'll come back to looking at some examples in the later lessons anyway. Um, if we think about that margin, we would maybe make a decision about what space we wanted for a margin at the outset. So in our layout, you'll see over at the side here, we have an option to specify a margin. And if I decided to say that I wanted a 20 millimeter margin all the way around the page and left this text so that it sticks with equal margins, it gives me a guide essentially that shows me where my margin is. So that when I'm creating my graphic, maybe all my text boxes or most of my graphics will stay within that. So now that I've got my margin, if I was to create anything, you'll see that if I um, create an object and I move it around, you'll see it'll snap to that margin. So it's easy for me to place things and keep them lined up. And likewise, when creating things like, for example, a text box, I can use that margin as a starting point and things will kind of stick to it. So that's basically all the margin is. It's just the area, this space around the edges that we've decided to leave blank, generally speaking. Now, we'll, there might be an exception to that that we'll come to in a moment. The next thing I was going to talk about is grids and snapping to grid. When we talked about elements and principles, we, we identified that alignment is a really important part of any design. So using a grid or a guide can help us create alignment. And within our layout here, you'll see that down at the bottom, there's an option to turn on a grid. You can also change the sizing of the grid. So if I wanted a grid that was 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters, I can specify that I want a 10 millimeter grid. If I want a grid that's 30 millimeters by 30 millimeters, likewise, I can make that grid 30 by 30 or even 30 by 50 if I wanted. So when we're creating our layout, we have a grid that we can then use. And again, when you're creating objects, you will see that it makes it really easy for us to snap those objects to the edges of the grids. Okay. So the grid is just one tool that we can use to keep our page all lined up so that when we're making different text boxes, objects, and so on, they'll all line up with each other. Now, we're not going to worry too much about using a grid. It's really just to illustrate the point. So you can try turning the grid on and setting up to different sizes. And you can even use an isometric grid you'll see here. But we're going to leave the grid off for now. But that's really all it does. It's just a set of kind of, it's a grid that's created that you can put things onto or that you can use as a guide. The next thing um, that we're going to talk about is the guidelines. So guidelines are kind of similar to a grid in so far as that they allow you to create kind of a guide, but where a grid gives you lines all over the page, it might be that you just want a few guidelines in a few places to help you line things up. And a margin guide like this is essentially guides as well. These are, are guides that I've created by creating this margin here. Now in Gravit, um, if you go to view, you may not have the rulers showing up. So if you go to view canvas, um, make sure that you switch on rulers. Okay, so when we show the rulers, way that we can create our guides. Uh, I'm not going to save mine because I don't need to, but you might want to save yours to the cloud. And um, the way we can create guides is by clicking on the ruler and dragging. And that allows us to place a guide. And you'll see over at the left hand side there, it tells me how far down it is. So I'm going to make my first guide about 60 millimeters down the page. And then I'm going to make another one a little bit further down around about, yeah, 330 ish. There we go. So I could use those, for example, to place things onto the page and keep them where I want them to be. You could also create a guide that, for example, helped you position the center of your page, or you might use guides to position the widths and positions of columns of text or a row or a group of images. Really, guides are to be used for anything you want. The thing that's important to consider about guides is that when we switch between pages, you'll notice that although the margin is different, the guides stay attached to the page so the guides are always there okay so they, they don't disappear they will stay the same for all the pages in your document now in this case i don't need that guide so i'm just going to drag it back over here to get rid of it i'm going to keep these guides because we're going to talk about a few other things 
But incidentally, where it says snap to grid or snap to guides, that's really what it means by snap is simply that the objects that we draw will snap to them, they'll attach to them. So if we grab things and move them about, you'll see they kind of snap onto the the guides that we've got there. And likewise with the grid, that's all snap means. Now, we've not really got very far with asking you to do anything, but so far I would have liked you to, if possible, create a 20 millimeter margin and also a set of guides. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is bleed. Bleed is a bit of a curious thing because it doesn't make sense unless you understand how printing works in a commercial kind of method. Um, so if we look at commercially printed things, quite often they are printed through what's called offset lithography printing. And offset lithography printers tend to print objects or print sheets that are much larger than the actual document. So for example, you can get maybe eight or 16 copies of your page or your poster or whatever it is on a single sheet. Now, that's really beneficial because if you've ever tried printing on a printer at home, you'll find that you can only print color up to a space within a margin near the edge. So for example, looking at our, um, our page here, these areas here where we've got text would be fine, but where we've got this kind of black and this kind of texture that we want to run right to the edge of the page, or like for example, in this, uh, I'll just find it here. Like in this graphic where there's color that runs right to the edge of the page, there's no white space at the edges. We've got graphics that run right up to the edge of the page. We couldn't print that in a normal printer. So what we quite often do is we create bleed and that's where um, the printing process prints more over the edges of where the page boundary will be. And then afterwards it's cropped. So when, when we were talking about how um, in printing, it prints everything on one page, it all then has to be cropped off. So it's all basically a big guillotine cuts up. And so we print more than we need so that we get our color or our image running right to the edge of the page when we crop it. And that just leaves us with the final finished product where we have our graphics or images or whatever running right to the page. So that's what we mean when we say a bleed. It's because the ink bleeds right up to and over the edge of the page. And then uh, Gravit and with other desktop publishing software, we can create bleed margins. Okay, so you'll see that here I've got some things that are hanging slightly over the edge of the page. So I'm going to just quickly show you how we'd set up a bleed margin. If we look above margins here, you'll see that we can put in bleed. And I'm going to put in three millimeters because that's the standard bleed. Um, it doesn't really look very interesting. Nothing much happens. But what we'll find now is that if I create an object like this box here, and I drag it up to the edge of the page, if we zoom in really close, what we can see is it will display the box up to three millimeters off the edge of the page. So it'll show the area that was bleeding over the page and then it cuts it off outside that space. So it helps me understand what area of these objects will run off the edge of the page into that bleed area. And that part there that's outside the page would be cropped off when the document was printed. So that's basically what bleed means. So with that bleed margin, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a shape at the top and the bottom, just a, a box. So we're going to use the rectangle tool, which we can find up here. We're going to create a box up at the top. And you'll see it doesn't matter if I drag it over the edges, it's going to stick to the edge of my margin. So that, that box is going to run right out, but we can only see the part of it that's within our bleed. Okay, the rest of it's kind of obscured from us. And we're going to change its color. So we just before we, we talked about this, we can go into there and use the color picker. I'm going to make mine black. You can choose whatever color you want, though. So we've created that black um, box of uh, or box that runs to the edge of the page. It fits out to the bleed. Um, and what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a couple of different tools that we can use to create objects. So some simple shapes that we can kind of manipulate using uh, handles, rotating, color fills, copy, cut and paste and so on. So what we're going to do is we're going to create this little kind of simple panda icon just using some basic shapes to kind of illustrate how copy, cut, paste, um, rotate and so on can be really useful to us. Our starting point is going to be to go up here and get the circle tool, which is called ellipse, and just draw a circle. Now it doesn't matter hugely what size it is because we can change that later. But what we do want to do is we want to make sure that that has a border. Okay, so we're going to add a border that's maybe don't know, maybe make that about eight. And I'm going to make sure that it's fill color. I can just use the dropper to copy the white color, or I can just go into the colors and set it white. 
So basically I've just got a circle which has got a white center and a black border. The next step is to do another circle, but this one is just going to be a plain black circle. So I'm going to make another circle here. Um, I'm going to make this one a bit smaller. I'm going to zoom in a wee bit so it's easier to see what I'm doing. Uh, so we're just making a second circle and this time we're going to use the color picker and we're going to make it a black circle. Okay. So we've got our two objects and when we click on them you'll see that we've got these things called handles. right? So that's what we mean by handles, these items here that we can grab to drag and resize and reshape. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to make a couple of shapes out of these two circles. So the first one we're going to do is we're going to um, take that circle. And we're going to make the ears out of it. OK, so I'm going to take the circle and I'm going to use the slice tool here. I'm just going to draw a line kind of roughly across there, maybe slightly above the top. And well, it should. Should cut it in half. It doesn't seem to be working for some reason. Well, I think it's because I'm. I think it's just selected the wrong object. That's my fault. I just need to select the thing I actually wanted to cut. So there we go. So having done that, I've now actually kind of sliced that into two parts. So I've got two half circles. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use one of them. And rather than um, making things more difficult for myself by trying to make both of them match, I'm going to make one of them fit the space I want it to. So I'm going to use this rotate handle. Now we can rotate using the handle here. Or you'll also see that we can change the angle using this angle control. I'm just going to use the handle so I can make that kind of the right angle. I'll pop that into there. And then rather than doing it twice, okay, I'm going to get this just the way I want it. So make it a little bit bigger maybe. And squash it in a little bit to make it a bit more like the shape of an ear. There we go. So we're just using the handles to manipulate it. And when I'm happy with that, I'm just going to copy and paste it. So I can right click. Uh, in fact, actually, with this, it's better to use Control C. So I'm going to do Control C and Control V, copy and paste that. And when I've done that, it actually just pastes the second copy of it on top of the one that I've already got. So you'll see that I can drag that off there. Now, having made that second copy, I just want it to be exactly the same but the other way around. So rather than rotating it, which I could do, I'm just going to use the flip tool up here. And that lets me make my here and you'll see we've got a guide and auto guide that's popping up at the top there to show it's aligned. So we've made our ears now. Now we've got that other half a circle left so we need a couple of other things here. And um, so we're going to start by using that to maybe make the eyes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to control C control V to copy and paste that. So I've got a couple of copies of it and I'm going to go over here and I'm going to make the eyes kind of by squashing this down a little bit make it maybe a little bit bigger. We'll play around with the positions later on but when I'm happy that I've got one of these I'm just going to kind of nudge it in place and I'm going to add a little white part for the eye by adding another circle. Incidentally actually I could just take that copy and paste that so that I've got another circle and just get rid of the, the box but you know whatever you want you can make your own circle. So we'll do our next little circle and again, this one's going to be white. So we drag that over here and just resize it down to a sensible sort of size. And having done that, we can grab the two of them. So we want these two things. And if you need to select them together, we can just hold the shift key and click more than one thing at a time. We're going to control C, control V again. So we're copying and pasting that once more. Make a second one. Okay. Next part is looking at the nose and the mouth. So the nose, again, probably just an ellipse is the simplest way to do it. Make a kind of an ellipse sort of shape. Make it black. Pop it in here. And the mouth, we're going to just use the angle control here to rotate that 180 degrees. And maybe resize it a little bit. Use the handles. Pop it in here. So we've got our simple little kind of panda shape and we're going to take this and we're going to just copy and paste it. Do that again. And we're going to use those to be little kind of indicators like uh, little hands hanging over something. So we'll just rotate that 180 degrees. 
that back to zero. There we go. Back rather than having to do that twice, we'll just copy and paste that. Copy and paste. Now we've got two of them. So we've made just a little symbol here, a little, a little kind of logo that we could use. So imagine this was for kind of a zoo or something. We've got our little icon here. Now we can highlight all that stuff and group it. So we highlight it all, then just click group selection. That'll just make it one thing. So that's us talked about how to use handles, how to rotate. Um, we haven't really talked much about color fill, although we did choose color fills for those different shapes as we we're making them. We just didn't really you know, talk about it as we were doing it. Um, we haven't really done any cropping yet, so we're going to come to that shortly. Um, and we're going to come into these other points here. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at some transparency and cropping. So what I want to do at the bottom here is I want to have uh, this kind of zebra print sort of thing, but I want it to go from dark to, to light on top of it. The way I'm going to do that is I'm just going to go online, find a zebra texture. So I just went online, searched for one, found this one that was a texture rather than a picture. And I'm just going to copy this image and then I'm going to bring it over here and I'm going to paste it. So cropping is, in our case, very straightforward because we want to do what's called a square crop. So we're just going to double click on it and you'll see that the cropping handles appear. And that will allow us to just crop out the bits that we don't want here. So I only want maybe kind of that proportion of it there. Yeah, so I can use that cropping tool to kind of choose which parts of it I want to keep. So I've now cropped that image. I might need to crop it a little bit more. I'll tell you what, I'm going to just drag it down to where I want it to be. And I'm going to crop it using my guides. I'm going to crop it out to my bleed margin there. I'm going to use this crop to drag it down to my bleed margin there. Okay, so we've kind of just about got that where we want it. The original image is a little bit over. I need to, there we go, nudge it back over a little bit. There we go. So my image is now kind of cropped. It's not quite as big as I'd like it to be. So what I maybe want to do is kind of make that fit out to my, my bleed. Um, yeah, just drag it out a little bit more. Bit tricky trying to get it positioned just right, but that's that's fine, that'll do. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add on top of that, to give myself that kind of effect of it fading, I'm going to do a rectangle, but I'm going to create a transparency. So just going to start using my guide here to draw that rectangle over the top of it. And then my fill, I'm going to choose this black color. But then when I click on it, if I go in here and actually click on the color choice, I get this set of options here. And you'll see at the top here, we actually have a couple of different options. Now, one of the things that I can do, which is really simple if I want to, is if I can just go over here, uh, I could make that a um, partly transparent just by changing this wee opacity slider. So I could make it kind of part transparent, but I want it to be like a linear transparency. So it goes from, you know, visible to not visible or something along those lines. So I'm just going to leave that at 100. I'm going to go into here and then where it says colorful, I'm going to go to linear gradient and I need to try again. <laughs> just click the wrong button. Uh, I need to go to linear gradient and I need to grab these little handles here to decide where the gradient starts and ends. I'll need to move the, the, the bit back across here, but I actually nudged it, but that's fine. So we change those back and forth. And at the end here, what I want to do is this end here. Okay, now this is maybe a little bit unclear, so I'm just going to try and make sure that I explain this well. So again, when we go back into here, we can see we've got our gradient indicator, this line. So down at the bottom here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change that. See where it says A? That's our alpha channel, so that's its opacity. Um, so instead of that being a color or anything, right, at that end, what I want to do is I want to make that have no color. So what I can do there is I can make that zero, okay? And by making that zero, I'll just change it back to black there. It's just like a weird red color. By making that zero, what I've meant, what I've done is I've made that part of the transparency go to, to zero, okay? And then I can drag this and move it to adjust it if I want to. So I can go from a kind of, you know, more or less black through to kind of more or less clear. So I've basically got that box on top um, with a kind of a, a transparency that's a gradient. 
And then we could use that as just a kind of little graphic at the bottom and place our little panda sitting on top of it. Now, other little things that we could do, um, if you click on an item, a shape, for example, um, we could, for example, add a bit of text in here. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I think, is I'll do a little box here. So imagine we had some text that we wanted to put into this space. I'm going to draw a little box on there. And we're going to make the box more easy to read by changing its color so that it's just a, a flat color fill. We're going to make it white. And what we're going to do is we're also, when we click on it, going to use this wee slider here to make it partially transparent. And that means if I wanted to put some text in there, nice and easy to see, nice and easy to read, um, kind of separates it from the background. And I can also, if I want, go down here and you'll see that I've got an option to create a drop shadow. Okay, so we can we can change various different effects on that drop drop shadow. It's probably a bit easier to see it if we bring it up here. Um, so let's just say how far it's going to go. We use these V sliders to kind of drag it. And we can decide a couple of changes about how how blurry it's going to be, or how dark or how light. So if I wanted to add a bit of depth, we can use that to create a little bit of depth on this wee bit of text that's going to go in there, pop that down on the background. So it's quite subtle, but we can see we've got our little kind of 3D effect there. Um, and you could try that with other stuff. You know, you could add your drop shadows to other items on the page. But that really covers the, the main things that we needed to go through at the start of the process. So the first thing we did is we set our paper size. We've made it so it's a single page format document. We've added a margin so that when we add any other things onto the page, we've got a border that we can stick with them. We've added where we used guidelines um, and we talked about how we could use a grid. Um, we've created a bleed margin so that things can run out to them. I haven't actually quite done it right down here. This should have been dragged further out so that it hits the bleed margin like that. Um, so that when it printed, that would run right to the edge. Um, <clears throat> we've talked about how we use handles to manipulate shapes. Uh, we've used the rotate tool. Uh, we've used the color fill tool to change colors. We've used transparency, which is part of the kind of colorful menu in Gravit. Uh, we've cropped an image, or in our case, a texture. We've added a drop shadow, and we've reused copy, cut, and paste. So those are the terms, and those are some of the ways that we go about applying them. In your next lesson, you're going to look at some of these other terms and how to apply text. Um, but hopefully you found that reasonably straightforward. If you've got any questions, though, do me let, sorry, do let me know and I'll be happy to help.